to episode two of Black and Blue Podcast. Yes, yes. My man Ken here. Yes. We started out a lot about our backgrounds, but uh, we ended by what our mission was. Yeah. Did you feel rushed on that one? I felt rushed. Yeah, like, because the timekeepers were know. just <laughs> rushing us. And then they lied to us. And they said yeah. we had more time. We're not going to yeah. fall for that again. No, no, no. So I, I think then it's a perfect time for us to... Um, Continue that discussion, like yeah. as we go into kind of like a part two of um, our backstory, you know, because there were some topics that you kind of glazed over that I want to learn a little bit more about because that movie Detroit, I've I've seen it now yeah. a number of times, wow. and um, it's really heavy stuff. And like you mentioned about the Algiers um, Motel, that's like a, a very um, important piece of that film. And historically, so I'll tell you, there's a, there's a scene. Well, a number of scenes in there, but the majority of the story you watch where these um, Detroit police officers and National Guard, I think the state troopers or state police, they had seen what was going on in the Algiers Motel and they were like, I don't want to, we don't want to have anything to do with this. We don't want a civil suit on our hands. And so they left, right? But there's one piece that is so important that sticks out in the film that I don't think a lot of people would have noticed, but but I did because of the type of work that I do. And I bring this up because I wonder if you're, um, what was that? He said, Chris, move your mic. Oh. Was, he was trying to be discreet until you totally called right, him out. Right, but he out. threw, he threw us both right. off. All right, cool. So, um, so there's this, there's this piece. This piece in the film that was super important to me that most people probably wouldn't even think about, but I did because of the type of work that I do. But so the majority of the film, these cops are just jacking up these brothers in this, um, uh, in the Algiers motel. Killed a few of them. Um, were just so abusing every sort of power and law and anything that you can think of in this film. But then one of the guys escapes, one of the main characters of the film. Uh, well, he didn't escape, but he got out at, at the end. And as he's running through this alley, um, there were two police officers in a car that had um, rolled up and, and saw him. And um, the compassion that they showed in that moment where you know they go to pick him up and they were like, who can do this to a person? Not even realizing it's... Mm-hmm a couple of their own back at the Algiers motel that had done this to this young man. And, and in that moment I was like, although society and America tries to portray law enforcement as the majority of them would have been the cops inside the Algiers Mm -hmm. motel, they did that. I tend to think differently, or at least I hope, I hope that, the majority of police officers that have taken that oath and taken that job would be the officer that when they saw this young man running up like that, all bruised up and bloody, and were like, whoa, 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 hang on, hang on, hang on. Don't die on me, man. Who can do this to a person? And he said it with such conviction, such Mm -hmm. compassion. And so when you brought up earlier about coming from generations of law enforcement, Mm -hmm. knowing that um, your father uh, lived through that, period or was probably even on the job through that period Mm -hmm. and your grandfather was likely on the job during the riots from the 40s um i'm curious about the type of stories Mm. that they told you and maybe things that you learned from them that made you the man that you are today because you know for people who are who are watching this who may have only seen a clip of your less walk video Mm -hmm. I can tell you all just from what I've learned about Chris and the man that he is, that that wasn't for show, that that's who you are through and through, like the type of man that you are. And and that's even the reason why I wanted to do this show with you, because I was like, I want to do this show with a man of honor, a man of Mm, compassion and conviction. Right. And so there there must have been things that happened in your life that got you there or things that you learned from your father or from stories of your grandfather. And so I'm curious uh, what those may have been. Well, let me foreshadow then a, re, uh, a reciprocal question. There's a picture of you that was sent to me by someone completely different than who's in this room, and it's a uh, it's a picture of you standing in front of the police holding your hands out. Yeah. Now I'm going to ask you that exact same question. Okay. But to answer your question, I'm the youngest of four. Um, my dad was a great storyteller, and he's 82 years old right now, works at a local funeral home just parking cars. Wow. He's a good man. 
hard working. My parents have been married for over 60 years. Mom works at JCPenney. And uh, my personality, my my fun and excitement comes from my mom. She's literally like five foot. She's yeah. tiny. Uh, but my conviction to help people, to be a warrior came from my father. He did seven years on the job and, and he left right after the riots and went into sales. But during the time that he was there, he was assigned to the tactical mobile unit, which was a specialized unit. And uh, I grew up hearing stories of the riots and and good, bad, the indifferent. My dad was the dude on the outside. Got it. And um, I say that because like you have vetted me during the times I grew up with my father. And so my dad is always taking care of, of, of my family. Mm-hmm. We didn't have a lot of outside influences. We had a very small friend group. And, um, uh, but I've always saw my dad and his family was the most important, like many families. Then fast forward, I've always grown up with the heart of helping people. And uh, I was never the athlete. I was never picked first in a team. I became an athlete later in life. And all those little mini life lessons of taking care of people, it really, uh, in my my personal belief came from a spiritual gift. Like the Lord had called me up to be the David, to be the Joseph of society. Yeah. And, and I didn't realize that until I started getting into my career because there's nothing more intimate when it comes to helping people than trying to save their life, mm-hmm. trying to protect them, trying to defend them from the monsters, Absolutely. trying to do an investigation so a kid can can know that the boogeyman is, is, is gone away. Mm-hmm. I mean, those are real fears. I've done so many death notifications, knocking on people's doors, telling them their loved one is dead, yeah. uh, arresting people uh, because victims are scared to, to be alone. I mean, all that stuff, it just, it builds up. I started taking my kids on mission fields since they were 13, so mm-hmm. I've gone all over the world on, on week-long mission trips, building churches in third world countries. I've always looked at my, my even when I was in middle school, I've always stuck up for the, the weaker. Mm-hmm. And I wasn't the strongest, but I always stuck up for the weaker. And... Um, that moment of the protest is exactly um, what you said. It was like a culmination of who I am my whole life. Yeah. And um, it's a question I've been asked multiple times is what was going through your mind at the time? And it was all instinctive because when you are built with a uh, an internal compass of morality mm-hmm. and uh, an internal um, direction of, listen, there's a need over there. Go get it. Don't yeah. just wait. Yeah. You talk about keyboard warriors. I learned that term mm-hmm. from you. Mm-hmm. People get on there and all the things they should do, but yeah. yet they're the last ones to go out do and it. do it. Won't do it. You know, these are the people, the Kens and the Chris's and you out there that need to be like, that's it. Mm-hmm. I'm taking off my helmet. I'm actually leaving my house. I'm going to go over here. These are the action steps. So the movie that you depicted, which I've not seen yet, I'm glad because when you first started telling this story, I'm like, where's this going? Yeah. I Because I'm like, I don't... I. That's the kind of mentality that got us where we are with this. Totally. But I'm glad you finished with those two caps of compassion because I can tell you, I've been on the job for a long time. And absolutely, I worked with people that are those inside the room and they still exist. Mm-hmm. But they are such a small percentage yeah. of the men and women that go out every freaking day mm-hmm. that don't do it for the fame and fortune, that go out there and answer a 911 call. And when they answer the 911 call, myself included, I don't say, whoa, whoa, whoa. What color are they? Mm. Where do they live? What faith are they? How much money? No, we put our lives at risk to go and protect and to save. Anytime you see a first responder, a firefighter, an EMS worker, but especially a police officer, I mean, right now, as of this recording, there's over 149 cops that have been killed just since January 1st of 2019 yeah. or 2020. I mean, what other profession in the United States that it's expected that yeah, you could that die? Many are gonna die? Yeah, you, you, there was just a state trooper that was killed from a head-on crash just this week. Wow. A Michigan State Police Trooper. You know, I mean, it's got a, it's got a family. All that to say, I think it's a lot of little things I call micro decisions in my life that have pushed me to be the man that I am right now. And that's what blows people's minds because they're like, is he really that dude? Mm -hmm. And the reason I brought you into my family so quick, because the story that you missed on episode one is how fast we connected, Mm -hmm. how there was an instant connection, uh, whether it's running or our first interview. And I'm like, that night he's coming over to my house because my house is like my sanctuary, just like yours. For you know, sure. when you bring someone into your fold, your family's there. That that's right. That's like you say, I'm letting my guard down, mm-hmm. and we're gonna we're gonna build this relationship. And I felt that with you because iron sharpens iron. The Bible's very clear on that, and we are like minded. And I think as much right now, if there was somebody screaming in the hallway right now, you and I'd be fighting to get out mm-hmm. of the door. Who gets first? Right, because you have the 
police officer's mentality, a police officer's heart. So do I, just like I have a heart of giving free hugs. Yeah. It doesn't matter what profession you choose, you can still do that. You mm, can do that good. as an accountant. You can do that as a pastor. You can do that as a UPS driver. That's good. Because the heart of a person is 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 who you are. It's not what you do. Mm-hmm. And um, long answer to short question, which transitions into, I see all those different people had a hand in my life. Clearly, somebody had a hand in your life to say, I need you to go to that protest and ultimately stand between the protesters and the police. Absolutely. And put your hands up and say, hey, I'm here as a, as a, as a, as a go-between. Like, how did that moment happen? Yeah. Um, for me, just knowing that um, if I didn't stand in the middle of some of those situations, um, I was already I was already seeing it right. I was seeing the um, the rocks being thrown at the officers, the pepper spray, tear gas, rubber bullets, and things going back towards the protesters. And there's a story that I don't often share. Something that happened in Charlotte back in 2016 that some of the officers there will remember it, and I'm sure some of the protesters will as well. Um, so, in response to the shooting of Keith Lamont Scott, there was the 2016 Charlotte, North Carolina riots. And as I was out there that night, uh, and, and like you say, if something broke out in the hall right now, we'd be fighting to who's going to get there first. Um, I had just come off stage speaking at the University of South Carolina. I came out of my lecture and everyone was glued to their TV screens in like the cafeteria or whatever that the eating hall was mm-hmm. where a lot of these young people were. And as I'm watching that with them, I said, how far is that from here? And they were like, I don't know, maybe 30, 45 minutes. And before they even finished, I'm like in the rental car racing over to to the front lines. And I had never even really been to Charlotte, North Carolina Mm -hmm. before, but I knew that my work was going to be needed there. And as soon as Mm -hmm. I got there and I'm parking my car, I just see mobs of people running past me and they're running away as I'm parking to run in mm-hmm. and there was this OG who had stopped me and he was like hey brother don't don't go in there they're shooting over there they're shooting over there and for me that was more reason why I needed to go in because I was like people are going to be hurt over there See? and so as I heard the shooting and I'm running in and I get there there was the flashbangs going off and then a protester had literally been shot in the face passed away right right there um, and that escalated but we don't know things. by who no, we don't know by who, but so watch this, right? So it escalated things to where protesters started accusing the police. And the police were like, why would we use lethal force and shoot a protester? Right, right. And so they're saying it was a pro, And so that heightened yes. things to the point where the protesters now felt the need to, they were saying they were going to kill police yeah. because they thought that the police killed one of these protesters, right? And so I'm having these conversations with some of these protesters on the front lines. And I'm like, there's no way the police are just going to use Lethal force right here in front of everyone. There's a line. There's a police line. And that's what they were trying to to say had happened. And so something that I don't often share is there was a point where the line of police were marching in and there's this overpass, like a um, kind of like a walking bridge. And there were a number of protesters that were up there and they had started to clear out as the police were marching in. And there was a few guys that I had seen where, you know, the parking stump, the little cement block when you park your car and it keeps you from rolling over yeah, too far. Yeah, yeah. They had picked one of those up and they were going up to that overpass and they said as the police marched in, they were going to yeah. drop it on their head, right? And so f- for me, those sort of moments. What year where, was this again? This was 2016. So those type of moments where you see me standing in the middle between the protesters and wow. the police, it's more than that, right? Because that's where that photo came from. But what was more than that? that Can you happened, put that photo up while he's talking? Thanks. Yeah, yeah, yep. So I, I think that what what was bigger than that was the things that people don't see. The yep. fact that there were protesters mm-hmm. that were in that moment that were going to try and drop that on the heads of police officers. I'm shouting with them like you realize you can break someone's neck and and they will die from that. Think of the cement block that I'm talking oh, about, yeah. right? That Three stops you pounds. From, exactly. Yeah. And so they wanted to drop it from a distance down on these officers. And so it's interesting because sometimes people see my work as just well, free hugs on a t-shirt, what's that supposed yeah. to do? But they don't know the conversations that I'm having with people yeah. out there on the front lines to try and de-escalate the tension that's happening there. And not only with the protesters. Oh, yeah. Sometimes it's with the police. There's been times where before the police will rush in to, to deal with a situation, I'm like, just give me 
five yeah. minutes, officer. Let me talk to them so that you don't have to use pepper spray or whatever. Yeah. And they're like, five minutes, man. And in that five minutes, you see it. We just saw it. And by the way, yes. I'm surprised by Luke, our show producer, who when you were doing your, um, what did you call it right now? Media it was a briefing. Media briefing yeah. right? So we're out there. This this was like literally an hour ago, right? And people will think that I'm making this it's up. Not, and I hope that someone real. captured some footage from this because you're giving your media briefing across the street yep. and two brothers are about to fight on the other side of the intersection, right? And so first we're hearing them getting loud. And mind you, just to set this up so you guys realize what I'm talking about, there's gotta be at least five to eight police officers standing on this yeah. corner while you're giving yeah. your briefing and across the street. Kitty corner. These, yeah. yeah, kitty corner to where you're giving this briefing. These two brothers are about to fight, right? And so I'm standing there. I'm listening to it. I'm like, come on, guys. Not right now. This is not the time that you want to break out into a fight on the corner. And um, right when I noticed, okay, this is about to become something because one of the dudes takes off his shirt yeah. and they started to square up. And so I told Luke, I was like, I'm going over there. And I wasn't even expecting Luke to go. And right as I'm crossing the street, he goes jamming over there too, crosses the street. I grab one brother, he goes and grabs the other one. Job, and I'm like, yo, Luke, it, he can roll That's with me it. to any protest. You can join me right, right here. There. Because there's there's a certain amount of courage that it takes for some men right. to do that. A lot of people will stand back and think, what if they have a knife? What if they have a gun? Yep. And some people think, what if that fight doesn't happen right now? What if these guys don't go to yep. jail? What if this isn't an embarrassment on my culture when these guys are right here on the corner mm -hmm. about to do this, right? And so I don't know those guys. And it, it started out with that handshake to a hug. You know, I grabbed him by both shoulders and I said, what are you doing, man? You don't want to do this right now. And he's like, he can't just be me mugging me like that. And I said, what do you mean? He said, I was just standing right here on the corner. He walks by, gives me the up and down look and says, do we have a problem? Oh, then yeah, then now we have a problem. And I'm like, why though? Jeez. Because he looked at you? Yeah. And so I start having a conversation with him, find out he just had a daughter 12 days ago. You want to end up in jail? You have an infant Same. at home, an and infant. You know what I noticed? You were in that shirt, right? Mm -hmm. That's called a door knock. The free hugs to me is a door knock. People see it, and then they open the door. Absolutely. So he had to square you up to see if he's even going to talk to you, yeah. and that's what you did. It definitely did that. It, it disarmed him right away. He felt like this man who is trying to break up this fight isn't isn't a threat to me. That's right. And it's funny because he looked older than me, but he, he said he was 23 years yeah. old, and, and he was just so enraged in that yeah. moment. I mean, they were already squared up about yeah. to go at it. And I was just so shocked. I don't know the conversation that Luke had with the older gentleman, but he grabbed him, took him down to one end of the street. I kept the other brother on the other side, and it was done. No one had to fight. No one had to go to jail. No one had to embarrass me. That's right. <laughs> you know, because I take embarrassment when people of color do things that are just unnecessary uh -huh. because what's going to happen? The media crew is right there. Yeah. All of you guys are right there. Yeah. Those cameras turn around and That's I'm right. like, come on, you guys. That's right. Really? Right? And so, so when I step in, when I'm standing on the line like that, that's what that means to me is how do I deescalate this? Yeah. How do I step in? How do I be a better representation of my culture? Like I've even said, why I wear a free hug shirt, yeah. it's... Um, how do I reduce this idea of toxic masculinity, especially in the black community? We always have to be so tough and yeah. macho. And if someone squared you, squared you up, fight them. That's Why? Right. <laughs> we don't have to do that. If someone squares me up, give them that. Yeah. Handshake, man, what's up? Oh, you know, and then it becomes Break something. Down, yeah. Maybe you make a new friend, yeah. right? Rather than do we have a problem. Right. So See, that's the trigger right there. And, 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 and if he doesn't respond, then he's a punk. Absolutely. So he's got to be like, that's it. And he put all of that stuff aside. So, yeah. I would tell you if you could throw that picture back up, I want to I want to point something out um, from a law enforcement perspective. Mm -hmm. When I was doing that briefing, I was watching everything that was happening over there, and I saw the guy take his shirt off. And of course, our guys were over there, but I saw you, Jed, over there. That is exactly what I'm talking about. Is is you have to have the DNA and good job, Luke, to to say all things aside, I'm going to go handle this. Yeah. On the flip side, that could have gone easily out of control. Could have had a knife, could have had a gun, yep. could have done something. But when you set aside your personal safety to go over there and defuse a situation, do you know the names of those two guys? Um, oh, I Do you know where they that. live? No. That's it. Because it's not about, it's about that one moment where you were able to step in, do your thing and leave. You're like an ER doc. Yeah. And I look at this right here. I don't know any of those. I don't even know 
if you hadn't told me it was it was Charlotte, I'd have never known that it was Where Charlotte, North Carolina, right? Yeah. But what you see is you see a uniform line of people, and you stand in right center street yeah. with two fingers up saying, hey, it's okay. Yeah, and I'm going to tell you, as a blue brother, you saved some of those cops' lives, man. I appreciate that. Thank you. And they won't even know that. Thank you. Yeah. Which is exactly why police do what we do. We save li- people's lives, and we don't even know it yeah. because our mission is most important. Absolutely. So that's why that's why this show is so good because our hearts are right. We just do different things. And yeah. uh, I got I got a question for you of your whole life. Yeah. What is your most horrifying moment? Mm. Um. Wow. I think a time where um, I I thought this could be it was um, in Charlottesville, not Charlotte, but Charlottesville. Uh, The day that James Fields drove his car into the 19 protesters, the footage that you see on a lot of the news outlets, CNN and such, that was actually a clip taken from my camera right here. Because as he drove into the alley, I was walking with the protesters. So to kind of uh, frame what was happening there, um, the night before was that Tiki Torch March, the guys in their khaki pants and the, uh, or the, yeah, the khaki pants and the white polo shirts and they're walking with their torches and chanting things like Jews will not replace us and a bunch of other racist statements that they were making. So that was the night before. So I arrived on that night into Charlottesville. Because, what year are we talking? Uh, this would have been, I think, 16, either okay. six, 2016 or 17. And um, so as I arrived that night, um, first of all, Sabrina was terrified, right? Because she's like... Sabrina's your wife. My wife, yeah. So Sabrina's like, KKK is going to be out there. Um, the alt-right, all of these groups are going to be out there. I don't like that you're landing at night where you haven't even scoped out the scene yet. I don't want you just walking into a dangerous situation mm-hmm. like that. And so I was like, you know, I, I have a good sense of when things are, are going to get bad. So, you know, I'll, I'll be mindful of my surroundings. And so I get there, these guys, they march in with their tiki torches and there were some kids that were standing around the statue. Cause remember all of these protests were happening around the fact that people were pulling down Confederate uh, statues, mm-hmm. monuments, flags, all of those things. Right. And so they were showing up to, defend these monuments and so these college kids had surrounded it because they were uh, talking about why they wanted it removed from the campus these guys show up and I don't know if you've ever seen the footage of what happened there they weren't just marching with those tiki torches they use them as weapons and they start attacking these college kids Mm -hmm. and at that time, because I had just arrived that night and I'm trying to use um, even the advice and wisdom of my wife of you haven't even scoped out that whole mm-hmm. scene. You don't know fully what's going on. Don't just go rushing into situations the way that you, you usually do. She's on like on the phone with me as I had landed. And um, I was like, I'm going to stand back. Right. And so I'm talking to some of the officers there, too, who didn't rush in right away because everyone was like kind of shocked that. Uh, those guys reacted so quick with their torches Mm -hmm. and who could have weapons on them? It's an open carry state. Some of the guys were carrying, some were likely concealed. And I think everyone was just really in shock about what was going on. So then the next morning, as that footage started to make its rounds on social media and in the news, everyone was already like agitated. Exactly. So the fights that were breaking out that next morning were ridiculous, right? So there's that one video that um, was all over social media where um, there was someone who had like a lighter and a, um, some sort of torch or hairspray or something. And he was spraying fire at some of these alt-right and white supremacist um, uh, crews that were there. And then someone fires a few shots Mm. into the crowd, right? So it was that type of scene. Eventually, a helicopter is over overhead, and it says this is now an unlawful gathering. Everyone needs to separate disperse. or whatever, disperse. And so as people start leaving, the protesters from the community said, let's march the perimeter of the city um, as kind of like a victory lap, right? And so they're chanting, whose streets, our streets. And for me, I'm like, there's no way you have the KKK, the alt-right, all of these groups, they're just going to back down that quick. I think something is still going to happen. Your gut just told you. Totally, right. So I'm walking around with this watchful eye. So as everyone is marching, and we can play even some of that footage uh, when this episode airs uh, to cut to it. But um, So we're marching, and 
the protesters march into an alley. And in this alley, there's very few exits as we're in this alley. And they're walking up this way, like where traffic would come down this way. And some of the cars that were already in the alley, they had just pulled to the side and parked because they wanted to let the protesters through. And we're talking about hundreds of people in this alley. And I'm at the top of the alley coming down. The hundreds of protesters are walking in this direction. And all of a sudden behind me, I hear that sound of the gas pedal going all the way to the floor. And because the police station was the next block over, I thought that this was a police officer in an undercover police car. Because back in Cali, they drive chargers and challengers and things. So it easily could have been a cop, right? So I was like, oh yeah, no big deal. Uh, And so I hear that engine rev. And so I start to get out of the way. And this car gets like right towards the entrance of the alley. And I'm thinking he's going to make a left turn to the police station. And he didn't. And he goes speeding into the alley. And so a bunch of us are like, yo, 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 slow down. There's people in the alley. And then you knew it was deliberate because you just start seeing boom, 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 as people are getting knocked up onto each side of the, uh, the, the walls in this alley. And in that moment, I thought we were under attack. And I was like, that, was, that made that one of my most terrifying moments. One, because I had never seen so many people injured in front of me that quick. 19 people. I thought it was more than 19 people at the time because of the size of the crowd that he went into, the number of screams and the agony as you start to hear that, and people who are bloody, people who are knocked out of their shoes. I watched a man get knocked out of his shoes, hit by the car, shoes go up in the air, and his body goes that way. I'm like, there's got to be a bunch of people dead in, in this alley now. And he gets to the bottom of the alley, had hit Heather higher, she passes away there, and then he reverses and comes back and runs people over again. And so at that point, I was like, I just trapped myself. This is it. I was like, there's gonna be other attacks coming into the alley because remember in my mind, there's all of these guys chanting Jews will not replace us and all of that the night before with their tiki torches. I'm like, that's attack one of what is to come. And so all I can do in that moment was like try and capture as much of the footage that I can to make sure that if anything happens to us, the police will at least have something documented before people start saying, well, his car was attacked or they blocked Mm -hmm. his car. And so I was glad we were able to get all of that out of the way right away. Because by the time the police showed up and we realized that it wasn't going to be a series of attacks, I went over to this, the, um, one of the first officers that are, arrived and I said, if you guys want to download this footage right now, you'll get a license plate, you'll get the face of the driver, Good for you. you'll get his intent, everything that happened there. And they took me over to the police. They said, download it right now. So they took that. And they so were, when he backed up, he left he reversed, the scene? Oh, reversed out with his like bumper falling off, reversed out, ran over more people on the way, and then took off was heading for the freeway so at the time that i'm talking to the police they were like we have an idea just based on who people said it was but you gave them the whole thing i was like here's the video you've got license plate his facial expression everything is right on this this video you can see evil evil that's that's the only way to describe it when you look someone in the face that's doing that he was just so set on what he was doing Just the look of evil. And I'm sure you guys see that all the time in your work. But that was what I saw. The face of someone with the intent to kill. And so he runs everyone over, reverses out. Um, I have that footage from what I recorded that day, handed it over to the officers. They downloaded it. Probably within the hour or so, they said, we're pretty sure we've got him. And I think they just recently uh, gave him life plus, 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 or whatever it was, because they added on the death. So uh, what would you say to your wife? When you called her the first time after that. You know what was so interesting? I was getting calls from people that I've done work with. So um, Chris Frunzi, uh, another officer from the Charlotte riots uh, who became good friends of mine. As soon as it happened, he was one of the first people to call. He's a police officer? He's a police officer in, in Charlotte. Uh, he's a sergeant, I believe. Um, uh, one of my mentors, Dwayne Clark. This guy's like a billionaire out of Seattle, really good friend of mine. He's another one of the people on the phone with me. A lot of the media outlets who I've become friends with, I'm getting calls from reps from like CNN, Ken, can you meet with us? We know you're in that alley right now. Um, Mm -hmm. Fox News, all of these people. And I'm tripping out like, how come my wife didn't call? Like, does it like, I'm sure the whole world is paying attention to what's happening. And when I finally spoke to her about it, she's like, I don't like to think about that stuff. Mm. I knew where you were. 
but I don't like, I just pray that you're okay. Everything is okay. Mm. And Kenny's not going out like that. And so I just don't like to think about it. And, it's and like she, a defense mechanism. Totally. Yeah. And so she brought that up again during a, um, when we were doing the Super Bowl commercial and they did a separate, like just interview of us in the house and they had asked her a similar question like that. And she's like, I just, I don't like to think about that kind of stuff. It, it would affect her ability to just, Cold. function yeah. yeah like take care of the kids and all of that so she just removes her mind mm-hmm. from that whole situation but for me it was easily one of the scariest moments of my life not because of what i saw but because of what i thought was to come and i was like this is attack one of many and we're stuck in an alley and anything can happen and and it was really interesting because i didn't know until about a year later that some of the protesters that were in that alley were armed and prepared to eliminate the threat as as well. Mm-hmm. But there were so many people in the alley that no one wanted to take that shot. And so in the video, you'll see it on my YouTube channel, when you slow it down, right as the car goes by me and I turn, there was a guy in a black t-shirt also, a white guy who like had taken his gun off of his holster and had started to aim it and I walk right in front of him. Everything was so chaotic that I didn't even see it in the moment. Yeah, you it wasn't until a year later, someone said, Ken, slow down the video at this mark on your YouTube video. And I was like, oh, my. I walked right in front of this man's handgun. And it had he had fired at that car, easily could have struck me. And so there, there are those type of dangers that exist there. So, so with all those people hit, who responded to help them? And how... Soon did it happen? Uh, the police got there. I'm sorry? Yes, the police got there probably not even not even two to three minutes in. Who was there alley first? was swarmed. Between police, fire, and EMS, who was there first? Police first, then fire, I just want to then make EMS. Point. Yeah, because uh, people were trying to open up and clear the uh, road for EMS. The police had already... They were already blocking off areas of, of the alley. And, and Who was helping the people? Who was tending to the victims? Tending to the victim. You know what was interesting about that? And I had never seen anything like this before. Antifa tended to the victims Good. first. I never saw anything like that. These backpacks that they were carrying with weapons also Trauma had first. Yeah. Have you ever seen anything like that? I mean, I had expected because it's it's for treating each other, but they yeah. treated it for someone else. Right away. Righteous. They yeah. were the first people on the ground. Yeah. To help people. Yeah, and that's why kids and packing trauma and all yeah. that. Yeah. So even though, you know, a lot of people give Antifa a, a bad rap and they have all of these things to say about them. Some of the things that I have seen or experienced from Antifa when I'm on the ground in the midst of things, I'm sometimes blown away. Is it really only five minutes again? Come on. Like now we're going into episode three. Do you <laughs> really believe them? I know. No, we do. <laughs> right. So, um, so that blew me away because I, I feel like there needs to be a discussion about Antifa because I'm sure there's things that you've experienced from mm-hmm. these guys and that I've experienced from, yeah. from them as well. But Bottom line is they're the ones that help treat the victims. But but I think it's because they're, they're like you said, hoping to treat each other first, right? Like when they get pepper sprayed at the riots, they've got things to... to quell the the pain that they're burn, feeling in their yeah. eyes the burn in their eyes um they've got milk there's other protesters that i see show up with shopping carts full of milk that they're pouring yeah. on but it seems like there's first aid trained members of antifa and their crews mm-hmm. so that when that happened they were taking care of each other first yeah. and and so by the time the police got there it was the first time that i saw almost like this peace between the and police they and antifa together. yes I had never seen anything like that. But that was strange. But but two minutes before, it was they they were they were after police. That's right. Yeah, two minutes prior. (laughs) But then when the real danger happened, it was she's. I think she's already passed away. Mm -hmm. The police are there. Antifa is Antifa is holding the blankets so that the uh, holding it up so everyone can't see exactly what's going on. They let the police in together. They're working on them. They're clearing the way, both Antifa and police, for fire and EMS to get in to do the work. And I'm like, why are we at odds, you guys? That's my point. Why are we at odds? It took 19 people hit and one person to lose their life to bring people together for the common cause of taking care of people. Totally. That's the mission. Totally. It was like in that moment, the only enemy that was there was the white supremacist who ran people over because now all of us that were in this yeah. alley, police, protesters, Antifa, members of the community, all we cared about were 
lives that were hurt? Yeah. How do we reduce the amount of people that pass away? Uh, how many people can't even stand up because they've got broken legs or broken arms? That was all everyone's focus was. And was it mainly white people that got hit? Uh, no, no, because the crowd was so diverse. Uh, it was, it was only of... a white girl that died, though. Okay. Heather Heyer. Um, and and one of her famous quotes when, when she passed away, um, mm. it was something like, I, I'll have to pull it up, but it was along the lines of, um, if you... Um, I don't want to butcher it because I want to honor her, her the role that she had. Yeah. And if, I'll have to pull it up. Maybe, Luke, if you could... Uh, uh, maybe throw it up. There's a Heather Heyer quote that they used a lot even during her her um, funeral, but it was a very powerful quote. It wasn't her quote, but it was the last caption on her Facebook um, wow. wall um, as she went out to this protest, but it really struck a chord with a lot of um, a lot of people, but it was something along the lines. I don't want to butcher it we'll, out. We'll put it up, but while he's doing that, we're going to close this show out because the next episode we're going to talk about uh, a horrifying moment in my life totally. that has nothing to do with the protest, but it, it changed the way I think. Yeah. And to your point, here's a, a moment of tragedy that you witnessed, uh, a moment of pure terror. Yeah. And I guarantee you have a memory burned in your head like no other memory when it comes to going to future protests, but there's a life lesson you learned. What is, if there's one life lesson you learned, from the most horrifying situation you've ever been in, what is it? I, I think if I'm looking at that situation specifically, it's that everyone can be at odds and, and feel like some of the things that we have have experienced have caused us to take sides. But when it really comes down to life or death, mm-hmm. I have watched togetherness happen in an instant. Dude, say that one more time. You know, when it comes to when it comes to life or death, yeah. I have watched togetherness happen in an instant, where people who were at odds in that moment, when it was a life or death situation, boom, one right. Two minutes earlier, before that car That's came right. through the alley, it was f the police. Yep. After everyone was yep. hit, officers over here. Yeah. His legs are broken. Yeah. Officers over here. Yes. She might be passing yeah. away, and it was like. All of that other stuff didn't matter in that moment because now we just cared about preserving life. Thank you. You know, and so yeah. that's it was it was such a, a powerful moment that I got yeah. to witness because for me, I knew that those things exist, but when you watch it, when you see it in real life, because now someone has died right like steps away. I stood over, I looked at Heather Heyer and I was like, I knew exactly how she died. So when the conspiracy theorists started saying she had a heart attack and died because of what happened, I was like, no, I watched that car. So there was a car in front of him. When he reached the bottom, she was wedged between both cars. That's how I think she passed away. And so people, the keyboard warriors who weren't there are the ones launching the conspiracy yeah. theories saying um, she she passed away because yeah. of a heart attack or because she was scared. Um, I, I missed the quote. That well, was, we're going to uh, end on the quote because okay. I want to give, we did not plan on, on ending this this way, but I'm going to tell you, I think that uh, we end with this quote. Because we always try, Ken and I talk that at the end of each episode, like what's the life lesson? What 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 is the takeaway from this? And uh, I'm going to give it up to you to say in honor of Heather. Yeah, that her, the takeaway from this show is exactly what you're about to hear. Completely, it was uh, if you're not outraged, you're not paying attention, and I think that's so true because there's so much going on, and it's very easy for people to just walk by and say it doesn't concern me. That's right. But no, this is everyone's problem. At society as a whole, we have to deal with these things. And so for that to be the legacy that she left the country with, and I'm glad that we're still talking about it today, three years later, that if you're not outraged, you're not paying attention. It could be outraged about any injustice. Completely. Human trafficking, addictions, failure to train or help mental illness, elder abuse, animal abuse. It doesn't matter. Absolutely. We need Outrage more. creates anger which creates and righteous anger can create action steps absolutely so we just hope that more people will pay yeah. attention and i hope that that's part of the goal of, of these conversations that we're having now i'm going to say this uh because i mentioned i've seen so many death so much death and i've done death notifications i might do something special and that is that you were there to watch heather right yes her family was not if you would say one thing to her mother, her father, her family, what would you want to say? We'll close it out that way. Yeah, um, I, I think just hearing her mother speak at the memorial, 
service, I saw strength in, in a woman that I don't even know how I can find that sort of strength. And, and you know, as parents, like it, no parent wants to go before their child. No one wants to pass away before their child does. And I don't know where you find the strength to, to even um, uh, address the world after something like that. But, but I saw that and I was so inspired and moved by um, the strength that the mother showed. And so some of the things that have come beyond that, like they've now named that alley, I believe it's now Heather Higher Way or Heather yeah. Higher Road. And, and so the honor that has come through that, yeah. even by uh, through her passing and the quote that was left there from this tragic incident, you know, because a lot of the people from that alley has have lived on and, and just left and forgotten about it but her mother cannot yeah. because he, she lost her daughter there in in that alley and i think that um it was a wake-up call for america that mm -hmm. if if we don't try and heal the wounds and bring people together and dismantle these ideas of white supremacy and groups that are just at odds or seek to harm or oppress other people. If we don't seek to dismantle that, then that sort of history will just continue to repeat itself. Mm -hmm. So to her mom, I, I applaud the type of daughter that she raised to be out there with the people. Although she wasn't, uh, um, you know, probably doesn't feel the effects of what some people in the community that she was marching for, mm -hmm. but she knew how important being an ally was. And so there she was go. out there and unfortunately she lost her life due to it, but it was not in vain because it allows us to still have this conversation today. And I think this conversation can help some people. There you go, mom. It's awesome. Hey man, uh, yeah, Chris and Ken here, black and blue. We'll see you next week.